Hi there, welcome to adding messaging support to the UI. In the previous section, we configured the back end with Spring's WebSocket support and we defined some messages. In this section, we're going to add WebSocket and SockJS dependencies to the build and then register some WebSocket message handlers in the front end of our template. That way we can dynamically update the screen as changes happen. In this video, we're going to focus on adding WebSocket and SockJS JavaScript modules to our build. We'll explore using web jars to include these JavaScript modules, and then we'll see how to load up required JS and then leverage that toolkit to load our WebSocket and JS components, SockJS components. When it comes to JavaScript modules, due to the lack of standards, there are many solutions out there. For example, some of the things are distributed through NPM or Bower. There's also different formats that things are bundled with. In fact, there's not even a consistent way that they're distributed within a module. In this course, we're going to focus on using web jars, JavaScript modules that are bundled up inside jar files and distributed with Maven coordinates. Now let's go into our Gradle build file and go down here, and we're going to add a few dependencies. These all start out with web jars. In this case, we're going to add require.js. We're going to add stomp.js. And we're going to add sock.js. Now, stomp.js actually comes out of the box with a WebSocket based API, but we're actually using SockJS to provide that for us. SockJS supplies us with a graceful degradation pattern, so we're actually going to exclude StompJS's WebSocket module. Now, with these added on, let's go over to the Gradle tab and refresh the build. Okay, looks like it's done. Now I'm going to go down to the dependencies and let's go drill down into one of them and see what this web jar looks like. If we go down to, down here to org web jar as well, we can see them, all three of them listed here. I'm just going to expand and look in here at require.js. What you'll notice here is that there's a, the actual artifact is at resources.webjars.requirejs.220. Essentially, Spring Boot will serve up anything at resources.webjars from the endpoint of slash webjars. And the rest is the path to get to the artifact, require.js, 220. And then here we have the choice of either the fully, uh, fully expounded upon require.js or a minimized version. But again, like I said, there's no standardization. So for instance, if you go up here and look at the stomp.js module and look in its resources folder, it doesn't necessarily have the same structure. And in this case, you would want to use lib and stomp.js or the minified version. And this is something you kind of have to discover with every module that you're going to pull in. So I'm going to collapse that back down there. Now let's go into our template. And from here, we're going to register require.js. Like I said, with Spring Boot, it will automatically serve up static resources, web jar content from the path of web jars, everything found at the resources.web jars. The rest of it, I need to put it in here. Okay. And this is the other thing about how you're actually going to serve up uh, packages. There's a lot of different tool sets to bundle up JavaScript packaging for delivery. Uh, Require.js is a very popular tool, so we're going to go with that one. Now, any, in any sizable system, uh, it's, always, it's almost always recommended to externalize your JavaScript source code. But this course isn't actually focused on JavaScript, so we want to try to reduce that footprint as much as possible, and we're just going to load it at the bottom of the page. So let's, we're going to create a script tag. However, in this case, we are, we are going to be doing a little bit of uh, leveraging in the next video using some of the timely features. So in this case, we're going to make sure that we're using the, uh, the inline directive. So we'll do a little bit of parsing. However, one thing is, is we don't want time leave to be parsing 
all the pieces of our JavaScript. We don't want it to look at it like HTML. So instead, we're going to wrap it with the CData tags. And then the CData, C -data tags are, in fact, commented out. Uh, these are part of the conventions based on the template engine that you use. So if you use Timeleaf, I'd recommend that you go read their reference documentation on this subject. And if you build an app and you're going to use a different time, uh, templating engine, just check what the specifics are for pulling in JavaScript modules. Okay, that looks, uh, looks correct there. Now with that, I'm going to go in and I'm going to define what's called an immediately invoked function execution or expression. So essentially, these little, the outside parentheses define an expression. Inside it, we have a function here with the brackets, and then right here at the end, we're invoking it. Now, what's the whole point of this? What this does is it takes this whole code block and puts it inside a functional scope, and it gets us out of the global namespace. And if that sounds incredibly cryptic, that may be something to go read offline, but uh, it's a highly recommended. One thing I want to point out, though, is we're using require.js in this fashion. What it will do is actually register the function at window.require. So from here, we can actually start saying, I want to pull in other modules and wrap some code around it. So we're going to, in our list, we're going to spec out the, the artifacts we want to pull in. First, let's get our stomp.js one. And then let's go get uh, the sock.js client. Let me slide this over here so we can get some full screen width. And what this require function does is we're going to hand it an array of libraries that we want it to fetch. And we want it to turn around and, and, and invoke a function with those two objects assigned to names. So essentially, the code that gets loaded up here, whatever, mod, whatever that module decides to export, it's going to be stuffed into this functional variable. And then the code from this one gets put into here. So right here, you know, we can do anything we want at this point. So basically, with this stuff in place, we're now all geared up to be able to write the code we want to to process WebSocket events. And that's what we're going to target in the next video. So in this video, we dug into using web jars as the way to load up our our WebSocket and SockJS JavaScript modules, and then we loaded them up using RequireJS.